I am Greg Waldron, the Asian Managing Editor of Flight Global. I'd like to welcome you to the first in a series of four Flight Global webinars produced in association with the Singapore Air Show and focusing on themes that will be big talking points in the run-up to and during next, year, next February's show. For this webinar, we are delighted to welcome Embraer as sponsor. The coronavirus pandemic has, had a de has devastated air travel and nowhere more so than in the Asia Pacific. An array of travel restrictions have effectively stopped international traffic in the region, reversing years of strong growth. While some domestic markets such as Australia and China are resilient with the abatement of COVID-19 in both countries, India provides a cautionary tale of what can happen to an air travel market should COVID-19 mount a resurgence. Initiatives such as rapid coronavirus testing, vaccines, and travel passports have been put forward as ways to reboot air travel and get the region flying again. Yet large numbers of valuable aircraft remain firmly grounded while expensive airport infrastructure sits idle. Prospects of a full recovery seem as distant as ever. Still, the crisis is bound to end one day. Passengers will return to airlines, but things will be different in the new era of post-COVID travel. To explore what Asia's post-COVID-19 reality may look like, I'm joined by an eminent panel that offers years of firsthand experience about the region's air travel sector. Our panel features leaders, leaders from two major trade organizations, a leading aviation analyst, and the regional marketing head of a major airframer. But before I introduce the panel, um, I'd like to remind our guests that we are live for the next hour, and there is an opportunity for the audience to ask questions of our panelists throughout the session using the Q&A icon at the bottom of your screen, and we will try to get through as many audience questions as possible during the time that we have. So, on to our guests. First, from our sponsor Embraer, I'm delighted to welcome Victor Vieira dos Santos, Marketing Director Asia Pacific for the Regional Jet Manufacturer. A tenure veteran, tenure veteran of the company, Victor is responsible for maximizing the impact of Embraer's sales campaigns in the Asia Pacific region. Second, we have Subhas Minant, who's the Director General of the Association of Asia Pacific Airlines. Subhas joined AAPA in March 2020 after over three decades in the Singapore Airlines Group, including a stint as the Chief Executive of SIA's former regional arm, Silk Air. Subhas offers a nuanced perspective on the Asian airline environment, its market dynamics, and the region's diverse political landscape. And Stefan, Stefano Barsoni, Bar Baranci, is Director General of Airports Council International in the Asia Pacific, representing the inter interests of airports in the Asia Pacific and the Middle East. He has over 20 years of experience in the aviation sector, representing both the airport and airline industries. And finally, uh, Brendan Sobey is an independent analyst with Sobey Aviation. Brendan provides strategic advice for a whole range of companies interested in aviation from airlines to investment banks. Over the last 12 months, he has been a thought leader on the ramifications of COVID-19 for the air travel sector and has written several white papers, studies, and media commentaries about the crisis. So let's dive in and find out what the future holds for aviation in the Asia Pacific. Um, thinking, I'd like to start with you, Victor. Um, you know, it's been a brutal year. Um, things are tougher than ever, but how do you foresee the Asia Pacific air transport market changing uh, in the wake of COVID-19? All right. Uh, hi, Greg. Thanks for having hi. me. Uh, great to have you guys. Great question. Uh, you know, if look, if there's one thing that uh, it's not too early to say is that, uh, and I know it sounds like a cliche, is that the industry will emerge from this downturn in a completely different environment, new dynamics, uh, new underlying trends, and not to mention, of course, intensify structural challenges, right? Uh, you know, crises have a, a, a transformative effect, and there's no reason to believe this time around is going to be different. So just to name uh, uh, a few drivers that we see primarily changing the industry and the way passengers fly over the next years, I would mention first and foremost, uh, lower demand. This is obviously subject to uh, how fast we can have a vaccine, 
the vaccination rates are not moving quickly, the infections are reappearing, India, Japan, here in Singapore, and our traffic won't come back up again until we have it uh, widely available, right? So, and, uh, and, and the recovery will depend, you know, it will vary a lot uh, 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 country by country, especially here in Asia, given the discrepancies among them. So the pace of recovery will be uh, uh, determined by proximity. And uh, by proximity, I mean uh, less, less regulations and lower risks. So nearby travels, the mask interregional uh, uh, traffic will be the foundation of growth while international will take longer to rebound, you know, especially because of the complexity of government uh, 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 regulations, mandatory quarantines, and the high risk of fast changing uh, uh, policies. Mm -hmm. Okay. Another aspect that we see is that lead times for bookings have shrunk from, uh, you know, to seven to 10 days on average, and everything is refundable. Forecasting demand is a fundamental change that uh, uh, will impact airlines and, uh, 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 and that, that airlines will have to face or are actually facing nowadays. The actual revenue management forecast that we rely on has become uh, uh, inaccurate. So airlines will need to adapt to an environment that is characterized by uh, high, vol uh, high volatile schedules and, uh, 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 and ever-changing travel restrictions, which will not give them the full ability to predict what might happen in the future. Uh, on top of that, business travel, you know, the, the real money maker for airlines will take years longer to recover if it ever does. Mm, yeah. uh, and that's, that's exactly uh, what we saw in the previous downturns in GFC in 2008 was a good example. Many businesses will be cautious to, you know, to travel given the, the ongoing risks. Business trips will likely be limited to in-person sales, client meetings, or essential business operation. Working from home will definitely uh, uh, blur the lines between leisure and business trip. Uh, uh, you know, the idea of working from home is actually moving gradually to working from anywhere, and that will eventually reshape the airline network and lead to a better regional connectivity. And obviously habits adopted during the lockdown, like uh, virtual meetings or conference calls could be, be become ingrained and therefore, you know, continued for the foreseeable future. And, uh, you know, given this, this dynamic and uh, even if the, the reduced demand is temporary and even if it's, uh, if, uh, uh, it's not structural, uh, the airline industry, we have to remember that it's intrinsically uh, cyclical, right? And its volatility poses a risk so what we see moving forward in this new dynamic is a growing relevance of the right sizing concept. You know, mm -hmm. airlines looking for flexibility to ride the ups and downs of the business model. So once that, that we see, and this is an important driver, we see a global uh, trend in favor of uh, sustainable growth rather than just, you know, aggressive capacity expansion, uh, uh, right sizing the, uh, uh, will have a cascade effect in the airline's fleet and the right size will be at the center of airline fleet decision from wide bodies to narrow bodies, from narrow bodies to, to regional jets. And the crisis has definitely cast a spotlight on the importance of uh, 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 the regional segment, right? So uh, we see gradually airlines moving from uh, 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 the one size fits all strategy to a more diversified fleet. I don't want to hijack the conversation here. There are many drivers that I could mention here, like uh, deglobalization, uh, growing roles of government, growing environmental pressure. But I think those points can give us a good hint about uh, how challenging the next years will be, Greg. Okay, thanks, Victor. Yeah, it's a, it's a tough time. And I mean, just to highlight, I mean, this panel, you know, in a parallel universe, we'd be sitting on a stage together, maybe in Hong Kong, maybe in Singapore, at an actual event, you know, physically meeting. And we probably wouldn't even have a web, um, you know, aspect of it. But now that's the, the permanent change we're going to see. So anyway, um, speaking, you know, airlines, of course, big headlines. Uh, you know, SIA came out with some very challenged results. You know, Qantas is talking about making a big loss this year. All the airlines are really, you know, more or less struggling. But of course, you know, the airports have been affected, you know, just as much, if not more so, than the crisis. And so I was hoping to go to Stefano and ask you, you know, what do you think the the long-term impact of COVID-19 will be on airports and how do you see that airport experience uh, changing? Yeah, thank you, Greg, and, uh, and uh, really uh, appreciate it to, to be here. Uh, good day to the Flight Global uh, community and audience. 
so uh, the um, of course victor has given a picture which is uh, very challenging uh, quite gloomy in a way <laughs> but uh, realistic. Uh, I can see where, where it comes from and uh, to some extent we share uh, the, same, the same concerns. Uh, at the same time, um, I, I just want to uh, share uh, some uh, uh, signals of uh, hope uh, in the sense that uh, uh, trying to profiling the, um, the region, uh, you know, the problem in the region uh, we are talking from, we see already uh, airports, airlines operating actively at domestic level and so uh, testing uh, new protocols procedures uh, and uh, trying to test also the you know the health measures uh, that are up to the task uh, so of course in compliance with the international uh, with the international standards uh, i do see this transition uh, to be very challenging hard to say what will be the picture in uh, four or five years time uh, certainly, it will take us uh, some time uh, to, to get uh, uh, to a level uh, where we can say to be out of uh, uh, the woods. Um, of course, the, the numbers uh, that uh, the industry, both IATA and ACI, have, uh, have shared uh, are uh, for a recovery in uh, 2023 for uh, the uh, countries, markets that can very much rely on a strong domestic component. Uh, a kind of a safe haven asset at this point uh, well, versus uh, countries where the which are more dependent on international traffic such as the middle east where uh, or the expectations is more for 2024 but victor has has been right in saying that forecasting is a, is a moving target and it's it will have to be it will have to be uh, reviewed uh, uh, in uh, in the future um at, at the moment what uh, what the airports are, are experiencing is, of course, uh, to, uh, to make sure that uh, there is continuity in terms of the business. There is a dialogue with the other stakeholders and the governments to make sure that, uh, you know, some processes that are proportionate to the risk uh, are implemented. Uh, and there are challenges ahead. Uh, I'd be happy to, to share my ideas with you afterwards. Okay. Now, thanks, Stefano. Yeah, it's definitely going to be a major adjustment for that, that airport experience as we, you know, get beyond this, when we get beyond this. Um, I guess maybe jump back to uh, Subas now as well. I mean, Subas, you know, you've got a very, um, you know, long career in the airline industry and, you know, you've seen everything. You've seen, you know, I guess the Gulf War in the beginning, you saw the SARS, the, the financial crisis. Um, of course, I imagine this uh, crisis takes the cake, but you know, what do you think will be the lasting legacy of um, COVID-19 on airlines? And also what are, you know, airline CEOs going to be thinking about as we start to move beyond the crisis? Hey, Greg, uh, glad to be here. Um, well, first and foremost, uh, I think uh, the, the biggest uh, change uh, uh, that we are going to see in the future is that, um, you know, um, uh, a lot of the things that we do uh, as airlines um, will uh, will have to be more focused on uh, the travel consumer. You know, what is the travel consumer's perception and what is the travel consumer's expectation uh, when it comes to air travel? You know, so uh, that I think is the fundamental uh, driver of uh, how airlines uh, respond and how airlines behave uh, in the new century. Um, and here, I think, you know, uh, we, we have seen that uh, uh, borders have been, uh, you know, tightly uh, managed uh, by most Asia-Pacific governments. But where they have done surveys, um, you know, the decisions that they have taken basically to try and eliminate the virus you know, uh, is vindicated because um, people uh, in the Asia-Pacific region are saying, okay, that's the way to go, you know. So um, uh, we should be we should be prepared, you know, uh, for the fact that uh, this uh, pandemic may be uh, endemic, you know, and if that is the case, uh, yeah. then um, borders will be reopened on a stop uh, start basis. You know? So even uh, even if uh, travel bubbles were to emerge, uh, you can expect that uh, you know at least uh, for the next uh, uh, twelve to eighteen months, you know, they may be uh, closed at very uh, short notice. You know, so airlines will have to be uh, uh, prepared uh, to do that. We always talk about demand and supply, but I think in the new century it will be written, it will be basically driven by demand. You know, 
rather than supply. And um, what is good uh, for the airlines to see is that there is a lot of uh, pent up demand. Evidence of pent up demand is overwhelming. You know, I mean, even even if uh, borders are open uh, just fleetingly, you know, for instance, uh, when we announced uh, uh, Singapore Hong Kong travel bubble, not once but twice. As soon as it was announced, and there was a huge surge in bookings, you know, and here in Australia, we have seen with the trans uh, Tasman bubble, the take up has been immense. So that is a, a very very uh, reassuring. And uh, people are, are prepared to jump on a plane, whether for corporate reasons or leisure reasons, you know, uh, as long as the governments have the confidence to reopen the borders. Uh, but the problem is uh, another factor that is playing on demand uh, is that governments will only uh, reopen borders when uh, uh, when the when they are convinced, you know, um, uh, that uh, the places that their populations are going to travel to have got the um, virus under control. You know, uh, as well as uh, their own populations uh, have been uh, uh, sufficiently immunized. You know, maybe 70, 80 percent of the population is vaccinated. So that being the case, I think I agree with Victor uh, uh, and Stefano that uh, the borders, uh, when they reopen, it will be done uh, in a very uh, uh, at a very slow pace, progressively. You know, uh, but I'm very uh, sure that uh, the demand will return um, to uh, pre-COVID levels. But in order to make sure that the demand stays, uh, I think airlines, airports, um, and all in the uh, aviation ecosystems, in, including governments, have to work closely to ensure that the travel process is going to be smooth and seamless, you know, and convenient for travelers, as well as uh, safety, safety is, uh, you know, uh, uh, is uh, taken care of. So uh, it will be a lot of uh, work to be done. The first thing that we have to do. Uh, is to uh, maybe come come to some global standards. You know, I think how governments have responded basically is a very nationalistic uh, fashion. You know, so as a result, you know, there is an unevenness and inequity. You know, in the way the uh, the uh, vaccination as well as uh, me uh, measures have been imposed. So this has also got to be addressed uh, for the future. Yeah, things haven't quite worked out as we might have hoped on, especially on the vaccination front, you know, with the very spotty take up. And even in, uh, you know, countries don't, are a bit wary of allowing people in, even with pretty successful vaccination drives over way. So I think there's a lot of psychological issues, you know, that need to be overcome. And, you know, we've talked about this before, Subhas, that government role is, is absolutely fundamental. Yeah. But anyway. But then I'm hoping I'm going to go to Brendan. Um, so Brendan, um, what do you see as the roadmap for the recovery? And um, another question I'd like to ask you too is what sort of airlines uh, will be surviving like from a business model perspective? Is it the full service business class, low cost carriers? I mean, where is this going to, who's going to win in the end? Yeah, so I mean, uh, the roadmap is, is very much domestic first as uh, Stefano was, was touching on from an airport perspective as well. Um, we see recoveries uh, in, in, in a lot of the domestic markets. I would say uh, there's very few domestic markets that have had full recoveries um, or, or and even fewer that have had full consistent recoveries. But um, so we've had a lot of setbacks in domestic markets um, after uh, partial recoveries or in some cases full recoveries. Uh, so it is um, it is quite inconsistent in the region. Right now we're going through a, a, a reduction in, in domestic in many of the markets because of new waves, unfortunately. So we're, we actually uh, peaked in terms of domestic traffic in Asia Pacific in, in the fourth quarter uh, and have seen reductions in the first and second quarter, particularly uh, excluding China, although China's also had a uh, reduction uh, during the Chinese New Year period. Um, so, so, but overall speaking, domestic definitely first, um, and we need to get to the point where we have more consistent recovery in the domestic market and more countries are, are fully recovered rather than partially. So a lot of the countries in Asia Pacific now uh, are well below 50%. Some like the Philippines and uh, Indonesia, Malaysia never even got to 50% yet before the setback. So they, they got to, you know, in some cases like the Philippines only got to 20% and now have had a setback. Um, so we need, we, need, we need more of those countries to come up to like the 70, 80% levels um, and then, and then eventually the 100% levels in terms of domestic. That's phase one, um, and I think 
that will hopefully start happening, um, you know, second half of this year, first half of next year. Um, vaccination rates in those countries are obviously key and containment efforts of the virus are key uh, because it doesn't hinge on, on border uh, kind of politics in this case. It only hinges basically on, on getting, uh, getting to a point where domestic travel can be done safely because enough of the population is vaccinated and the containment efforts are there. So that's, um, that's gonna help a lot of the airlines in that initial phase. And then we'll eventually get to the international phase, which is gonna take much longer uh, than domestic. Um, the, the beginning of that phase hasn't even started yet. It keeps on being pushed back. Um, you know, there was hope uh, at the beginning of this year that we'd start seeing international start to reopen, you know, in, in the second quarter of this year, that's been pushed back now to, to at best end of this year, probably more realistically, 2022 as the, as the start of that phase. And then of course that phase will, will continue for a few years before we get to a full recovery. And then of course there's question marks whether we'll even ever have a full recovery given some of the issues that like Victor was raising like, like the corporate travel issues. Um, certainly the, the leisure segment um, uh, and, the, uh, and the VFR segment and the worker segment will, are more resilient. Um, some of that, some of that's, you know, will we'll recover very fast and there's a lot of pent up demand. So as soon as it, it, it's, it, people can travel, we'll see a lot of leisure and particularly a lot of VFR travel. A lot of the bubbles even that we've seen so far, a lot of that's VFR driven because people who have families uh, in, in kind of uh, spread across different countries, they haven't been able to visit each other. And that's a lot of the initial demand will come from that segment of the market. So Asia Pacific, uh, you know, will, the international in a nutshell will, will take a long time and, uh, and, uh, and won't start until we, we finally have some opening of borders. And, and uh, unfortunately, at this point, it looks like it's going to take longer than even the rest of the world because what we've seen is, is uh, more, uh, more aggressive uh, open reopening or, or, or maybe less conservative or, or more, uh, you know, it depends on how you look at it, more reasonable in some cases, uh, you know, moves to open borders. Um, in, in other regions of the world, even last year, partial reopening, some of that obviously got, um, didn't last long and was, there was reclosures, but now we're really seeing movement like in the US uh, and in the yeah. EU with what happened yesterday. So, but in, 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 in ASEAN or in other, re in other equivalents in Asia, that's just not happening and it's gonna take, take a lot longer now. To quickly answer your, your second question, um, business models, again, it's um, a lot of it hinges on domestic, Airlines, certainly with more exposure to domestic, are a little bit better off. Airlines that are more exposed to cargo are better off. Um, and airlines that are exposed to more leisure and VFR are better off. But, but, uh, the big, the, the, but a big factor is actually not necessarily the model, but, the, uh, but who's, who's behind the airline. Who are the shareholders? Who's, the backing, who's backing the airline? Um, if you have government shareholders that are very supportive, that's, that's kind, of, kind of takes the cake. So you can have an airline that's maybe has zero domestic, uh, has limited cargo, uh, really doesn't have, a, have, you know, really has the, you know, the worst outlook, but if they're backed by the government and have that support, then they're all of a sudden they have, they have the best position. Um, so, I mean, that's really a, a key variable in terms of who's gonna, who's gonna really survive this. But uh, so far we've had very little uh, consolidation, hardly any failures in the region because, um, you know, uh, not only have government supported airlines, but industry has supported airlines, which is probably even more important. So, so airlines that, are, are, that could have failed have not failed because uh, suppliers, particularly leasing companies and manufacturers have uh, really been quite patient, at least so far in working with these airlines. What, how, how, how patient they can be in going forward in terms of number of years is another question. And some of them might lose patience and you might see a little bit more consolidation. Um, but it won't necessarily be a certain specific model. It's really about financial strength and, um, and, and a lot of that is going to be the, the, the number one criteria. So it comes down to the, you know, the money Greg, that can come into the airline. If I may, Greg, uh, build on uh, the points that uh, have been raised by Victor Subas uh, okay. and uh, Brenda, uh, you, you can see that all of us mentioned uh, the tra travel restrictions, mentioned uh, uh, the epidemiological control of the epidemiological curve and the vaccination. Now, this uh, three elements, uh, realistic, de facto, or potentially, should have an impact on traffic, and they have an impact on traffic. Uh, they are strictly intertwined, but not necessarily there is 
a direct correlation between those. I, I come, I pull from a, uh, um, I took from uh, from Hong Kong, and as you can see here, the uh, control of the epidemiological curve has been uh, very very good. Uh, unfortunately, there is this is a, a platform uh, that is fully dependent on uh, international traffic. Unfortunately, international connections are rare; is not zero actually. And, uh, and so you, the, the point is to see how much these three factors uh, will evolve. All of us are looking strict very, very much on vaccination. And we have some timid, timid signals that vaccination may uh, be factored in and uh, be a really a game changer. But at the moment, uh, we are still in its infancy. Now, only three states have all the 60% of all the vaccines. So it was mentioned by Subhas, very uneven process. Only 5% of population in Asia got one dose of vaccine. And uh, interestingly, Asia and Africa, which are the most populated continent, are also the ones that got less people to be vaccinated. So those are aspects that, of course, are of concern. But again, if we narrow down the analysis on the, the countries that either are opening to international traffic uh, subject to vaccination, you can see that the pent-up demand is there in terms of booking. Or when you have a positive rollout, like the US, like Europe, or in the Middle East, Bahrain and Israel, you see that the connections are there, they beat bubble and we'll see if this can uh, work in the medium long term. We will have to carefully uh, monitor it. Well, hey guys. Yeah, uh, you know, uh, if I may chip on. in here, uh, Greg, I agree with Stefano. And I think uh, what we need to see um, is uh, governments prioritizing travel and tourism. Mm -hmm. You know, because at the moment, travel and tourism is the lowest rung on the ladder in their um, list of priorities. You know, I mean, this is understandable. Of course, uh, the, the government's moved into emergency mode uh, last March. Um, and uh, they have been in emergency mode uh, pretty much uh, the whole of uh, this pandemic period, you know. Uh, and they, the priority is, of course, uh, protecting and safeguarding the, the, their residents. You know, we can understand that. But uh, along the way, I think it is important, important for governments to also prioritize travel and tourism and trade because these are very important parts, you know, of the uh, economic uh, build uh, of the Asia Pacific region. And don't forget, Asia Pacific is not a, a contiguous continent, you know, so air travel is a very important part of it, you know. So if airlines survive, you know, if airlines survive and air connectivity is, uh, is built up progressively and uh, there is uh, pent up demand for which there's a lot of evidence as Stefano has also mentioned, um, then I think, you know, uh, recovery uh, uh, will be uh, uh, more or less uh, uh, assured. It's only a question of time when governments feel confident enough to uh, reopen their borders, you know. So uh, that, is, uh, that is very important for us to bear in mind, you know, that uh, airlines need to survive. And it's uh, not a question of uh, picking winners or losers, but really, you know, all airlines, you know, uh, are in this board, uh, not of their own making, you know. So, they have to survive to ensure that the, the aviation sector uh, survive, uh, 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 survives this crisis. And it's not just airlines, you know. You have to take the whole ecosystem because airports, um, uh, airlines, tourism establishments, you know, uh, they're all affected, you know. So it is uh, really a whole uh, whole economic sector, you know, that, uh, that has to uh, uh, be, uh, you know, propelled up uh, upwards, you know, uh, as soon as the uh, borders reopen. Right. Well, curiously, we've got some, um, a lot of really good questions um, uh, flooding in. And, uh, you know, a question that came in that kind of relates to, you know, this kind of the, what you know, Stefano and uh, Subhas's point is, uh, one of the uh, viewers has pointed out that uh, post 911 and the great financial crisis, um, you know, there was actually a real travel boom. I mean, things really started to pick up, that up, pick up again. Um, is that realistic? I mean, I think if we could start flying, and I think there'd be a tremendous boom, but is that really realistic to expect 
um, uh, in the Asia Pacific, given the way things are going, that post-crisis boom. Maybe, Victor, do you have a perspective on that? I, I think, Greg, that uh, more important than um, when uh, the traffic will recover or, or how fast you know, the mask or international will reach the pre-pandemic levels. I've, I think the most important question here is not when, but it's how the industry will emerge. Okay. I mean, because what we've, what we've seen, especially here in Asia, in Southeast Asia, uh, precisely, is that airlines uh, historically have been focused on aggressive capacity expansion, searching for the lowest cost per seat. And uh, you know, overcapacity always amplify the, the, the impact of uh, downturns. And in the end, what we saw in the crisis made apparent is that their lines, uh, you know, with the one size fits all, they don't have the flexibility to cope with the fluctuations in demand. So, I mean, uh, um, of course, IAT has been talking about domestic recovery in 2022, 2023, international 2024, 2025. But to be honest with you, I, I don't have the illusion of predictability. And this is, uh, um, it's an indication, but it's, it's anybody's guess. Uh, I think it's more important here is to discuss how the industry emerged because, you know, airlines need to face uh, uh, um, head on the, the threats that have been uh, um, impacting them uh, 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 even before COVID uh, and question what kind of industry they, they will want as we emerge from this downturn. So I think this is more critical than, than when actually. Okay. May I also want to touch that point whether we're going to have a big upswing um, in Asia? But I mean, it's a lot to predict, I admit, but anyone else have a stab at that? I mean, I think, I think it's, 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 very, yeah, it's very difficult to predict when. Um, I think the, the fundamentals of the market here in Asia are still excellent with middle class growth, economic growth, um, but this is not going to be like a, you know, 9-11 or the global financial crisis or any other crisis we've seen. And I think um, the idea that, that, that we, you know, this is, this is like that was kind of, you know, defeated um, several months ago. I think in the initial phases of this crisis, people were comparing it to SARS or other crisis, but this is completely different. Um, mm -hmm. Where, where you, you're, you're not going to get a necessarily quick bounce back. You'll have a, you'll have an uneven recovery, uh, inconsistent recovery um, in terms of the recovery curve. Um, and nobody knows uh, how long it will take to fully recover or if even it will ever fully recover. I mean, everybody has their guess and, you know, the 2024 uh, guess, you know, is quite a good guess and it's pretty much the consensus, but really nobody knows. It's, it's, it's impossible to predict even a couple of months from now as we've seen uh, how difficult it is to predict uh, capacity and how, how schedules uh, that are filed are not sticking at all, even you know, for next week, yet alone next month or next year. So it's, um, it's, 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 uh, you kind of have to throw that out the window, but the fundamentals of the market are still there. Uh, so when, that, where, you know, when there, people are able to travel again and, 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 uh, and can do so safely and the government's are ready to, um, to, to, to open it up fully again, then, then I think the, you know, the fundamentals will be there. And that, you know, to touch on some of the points that Victor was saying, I think, um, are quite important, but uh, again, it's it's a very early, too very early to predict this. Um, you have um, a lot of uh, airlines with with um, a lot of fleet that that they're sitting on with, uh, and airlines sitting on huge order books, uh, particularly in Southeast Asia. So, and they 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 haven't wiped clean of those commitments. A lot of them have just been deferred out. So they uh, they they they're they're going to be they're going to be very. It's going to be very difficult for them to, unfortunately, get out of that kind of um, uh, capacity, overcapacity, uh, and very low pricing scenario because they're going to be desperate to uh, get as many aircraft back in the air and then take as many of those aircraft that they have in order. And that's going to be there's going to be a lot of pressure to to um, to to get back uh, that capacity and to and to price it and to stimulate the market, which will in turn help Asia recover, but. The problem with that, of course, is that it's it will it will also be um, difficult to return to profitability uh, with that kind of environment, and uh, and it won't fix a lot of the issues that we had in this industry, particularly in Southeast Asia prior to the crisis. Um, so it's kind of a good demand story, but not necessarily a good supply story because I think there's a lot of distortions that haven't been fixed. Okay. 
All right, interesting. Um, Stefano, we got a uh, question from the, you know, an audience member. I think this one came from India, actually, and um, talks about airport investment. Um, you know, in Singapore, we've got T5, which is going to be bigger than all the other airports we have here combined. Um, you've got things like Dubai World Central. You've got a new airport coming up in Vietnam. And um, basically, the question is, do you feel that you know governments are going to balk at these massive airport infrastructure projects after this experience with COVID nineteen? Yeah, it's a, it's, it's a very good question, and thank you for uh, for raising it. Uh, they, I think that um, if, if we uh, look at what we have just said, uh, uh, the strong domestic uh, resilience uh, will keep a large of uh, a large number of uh, capex uh, projects uh, uh, intact. In addition to this, uh, we also have to consider that since the fundamentals are there and from a macro uh, perspective and micro perspective, uh, uh, including the fact that uh, propensity to fly in, uh, um, in Asia in particular has a high margin to improve, including the fact that there is not the same level of substitution uh, that you can find in other uh, regions of, uh, of the world, and especially refer uh, about the mature, the more mature markets, uh, then um, you, I, I come to get the conclusion and the industry then come to, to the conclusion uh, that uh, there is a need uh, to, to build for, for the future. Let's not also forget that um, the two aspects. Uh, the first one is uh, the uh, profile of uh, uh, of the business, the airport business, uh, with uh, that has to invest in the long term. But secondly, a matter of competitive advantage. I mean, uh, the so-called capacity crunch that has uh, uh, impacted Europe to the point of uh, uh, losing its competitive advantage versus the Middle East and Asia was partly dependent on the fact that that uh, the people who had to take the decision and make the approval for it uh, took too long to do it. Whereas in Asia, uh, fortunately, we are uh, still uh, privileged uh, by the fact uh, that uh, plans are uh, set and implemented in a faster way. There are regions such as India from uh, where uh, you know, the, 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 the person uh, uh, come from but also China, which have experienced until 2019 a kind of a catch-up mode uh, process, whereby you you get to you build something, and after two three years, it's already congested, and it's typical, for example, of India. Uh, more than 50 percent of the green uh, field airports are uh, planned to be built in this region globally. So because of that, I can see beyond this transition, very difficult one, still uh, a need, but also an opportunity for uh, the region uh, to uh, build it for the future. Okay, so still a future for big airports then? I think so, yes, absolutely. And, and even, even the, uh, I mean, of course it's difficult to predict the future, but even the, uh, the, the concept of a hub and spoke in my opinion, is a concept that has the opportunity uh, to take advantage of this crisis. Uh, if you think about the level of complexity, if you think about uh, the importance of liquidity, of connections, uh, of potential consolidations of uh, uh, their customers, you see that uh, that have naturally concentrated their, their links with uh, the main gate uh, in, in the country. There are certainly opportunities this will be subject, of course, on uh, a, a good cooperation, a, a, a good cooperation between airports and airlines and governments. So not just in Asia, but also in the Middle East, there are those opportunities uh, because there are very experienced players uh, uh, that can go beyond the crisis. But it will be hard. Thanks, Stefano. Now, um, since we're uh, Flight Global, we'd like to talk about airplanes a little bit. Um, and I've, we've got a few questions that have come in from, from the audience asking about um, regional jets in the region. And so um, one of them one of them says it's directed at Victor. Um, do you see airlines moving to smaller size aircraft as we emerge from the crisis? You know, maybe away from 
And what's your what's your perspective on that? Well, uh, yeah. First of all, um, we see around 1,700 aircraft being delivered in Asia Pacific over the next 10 years. Okay, and uh, um, part of it will be driven by uh, the right size, like I mentioned before. And what we see, and this is obviously not a new trend, but uh, um, an intensification of we, what we have already seen before, is that uh, you know the fear of uh, contracting the virus and uh, 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 the increasing increased complexities driven by social distance measures in major airports will likely push passengers to avoid congested hubs. So uh, non-stop point-to-point -point operation will still be, and even more will be preferred, uh, 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 which in many cases is econo only economically viable with uh, smaller aircraft, as you know, in many mm -hmm. markets, there's not enough demand to sustain a large narrow-body aircraft operation. There are right now in Asia, more than 600 city pairs with at least 25 daily passengers each way with no direct flight. Uh, markets like, uh, uh, um, Guangzhou, Taishun, or, or, or Jeju, Fukuoka that have no uh, non-stop flight and not enough demand to sustain a large middle body aircraft. So new smaller uh, regional jets like the E-Jets, E-2 will offer the, uh, uh, you know, the opportunity to fly thinner domestic and inter-regional city pairs where no one is flying. So, you know, it's purely the blue ocean strategy uh, 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 here. I'm not saying the current crisis will represent the end of the hub model. Definitely not. You know, it's the economic mm -hmm. benefits will remain largely intact, including maximum uh, uh, connection with uh, the minimal number of flights or air services in routes that would otherwise not be viable based only on local demand. But on the domestic sector, I see a growing need uh, for airlines in, in a, let's say, a defensive strategy using a smaller aircraft to adjust the aircraft capacity to market demand, but also a kind of uh, offensive strategy where they would be uh, have the opportunity to fly and serve long and thin routes that cannot be served efficiently by a large robot aircraft or markets that are beyond the typical operational profile of, um, of turboprops. So there is a, a gap in the market and that's exactly where we see smaller uh, uh, jets tapping and offering uh, multiple uh, 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 options in terms of uh, 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 missions to, to provide the most efficient uh, 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 service for airlines. Okay, uh, thanks Victor. Anybody else wanna to touch on the, the, the fleet, the future fleet? Uh, uh, I'm sorry. Uh, uh, go ahead. Yeah, go ahead, Brennan. Okay, um, I mean, I think it really varies by market, first of all. I mean, you have to look at Asia Pacific because there's so many different diverse markets. So you have China as kind of its own market and then ex-China, which is, um, you know, China's reco also recovered a lot faster than the rest of the Asia, which has been um, recovering slower than the rest of the world, while China's been recovering faster than the rest of the world. And then even when you peel back um, the markets in Asia, you have mature markets like Japan, Australia, uh, that, that behave a lot differently than the emerging markets. They have a different profile in terms of um, competition and, and particularly important in this case is the different profile in terms of yield, uh, in terms of average airfare. Um, and the, the, the issue is, is, and is that uh, in, the, you know, in the mature markets, I think there's actually a lot of opportunity for, for right-sizing, we've seen that already. And we will continue to see that um, in the emerging markets. I think it's a slower process. I think uh, you, 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 it could take a lot longer, um, given the, uh, the, the the intense competition. The, the overcapacity is kind of installed already. You have too many airlines, too many aircraft, too many larger aircraft. And also, very important to point out is, is uh, and this is an airport issue, is is the slot constraints and congestion. Well, there's Obviously, that's not an issue during the pandemic. It will become an issue again. So places like Manila and Ho Chi Minh uh, and many others um, in the emerging markets, uh, you just, you, the, the airlines are trying to maximize slots and they have a densification strategy uh, to, to maximize those slots. So you see actually a push to larger narrow bodies, uh, A320s to A321s, uh, and even a push in some cases to, uh, to, to from narrow bodies to wide bodies and, from wide bodies to, to larger wide 
So what I think what's going to be very interesting in, in the post-pandemic environment is, is the in, in, impact on uh, and emphasis on cargo, which a lot of people uh, are expecting, um, you know, uh, a more of a narrow body focus uh, because of the lack of passenger demand. Um, but actually, the, pro ish, the cargo would dictate the other something else. And we've already seen this during the pandemic where a lot of airlines are operating wide bodies instead of narrow bodies, uh, including here in Singapore, where you have, um, you know, an airline like Scoot uh, operating 787s instead of A320s, even though their load factors are 10%. The reason is, is that you look at the trip cost uh, of a 787 versus an A320, and then you look at the cargo capacity, and then you look at the cargo revenue, it actually makes more sense to use a cargo, uh, wide body for cargo. And that's maybe not going to be temporary. I think there's actually going to be um, some resurgence on, on, uh, on especially the more efficient wide bodies, like, you know, the tw efficient twin engine wide bodies, and that um, that will dictate um, in the future due to the slack constraints and the, and the whole cargo dynamic. And then smaller aircraft will be, uh, you know, certainly a big play in, in, in some of the more mature markets and as a niche role in some, uh, in some of the other markets, you know, where you, you do have airports, for example, uh, uh, Samui uh, and um, uh, uh, Kong Dao in, uh, in Vietnam, where you can't you, you have growth, but you cannot use larger aircraft. So there's definitely niche roles as well. But um, bigger picture, it's it's uh, it, a lot of it would be larger narrow bodies and even wide bodies in Asia, uh, which was already the trend before the pandemic. A lot of that will return, I suspect. Fascinating. So um, more questions. We got so many questions to go through, but we only have a few minutes left. But I think I've got a question I'd like to ask uh, posed to Subas, you know, coming from just kind of consolidating a few questions I've got on the panel here. Um, Subas, this is about travel passes. You know, um, you know, what is the future for travel passes? I mean, what do you think the uptake will be and what will be the, will they be still be used well and, you know, after the crisis has abated? Um, you know, a number of your airlines, of course, are working with travel passes. What's your perspective on that technology and how it's going to help us in the future of that technology? Well, I think it is uh, it's really a, a great blessing, you know, that uh, we have got uh, so many travel passes, you know, just like it is a great blessing that, you know, in the space of uh, what, eight months, nine months, you know, we were able to come up with vaccines, you know. So uh, travel passes is also a, a great uh, uh, saving grace uh, in all this. Um, and don't forget that the industry uh, was already looking for uh, smart technology solutions to uh, enhance the travel process even before COVID, you know. Mm, uh, yeah. I know it's been taking us a long time, you know, uh, but now uh, it has become imperative that we have a, a electronic and we have um, uh, digital solutions uh, to navigate the travel process, especially with all the uh, different and divergent travel requirements and health requirements that are now uh, uh, coming into place, you know, uh, it's going to be a nightmare for for the modern traveler if he doesn't have a solution at his uh, fingertips. You know, mm -hmm. so I think travel passes uh, are great, and if you look at the travel passes that have come about, uh, they have all uh, tried to address uh, the needs uh, of the travel consumer, a repository of all the uh, restrictions uh, uh, at the touch of your uh, finger. Uh, at the same time, you know where you can go and get. Uh, your testing done, where you can go and get your vaccination done, uh, means by which uh, these uh, vaccination centers and labs can send the results to you, and also a, a provision for you to send it to border agencies to get a travel authorization to travel. The only thing missing uh, is that many of these uh, things which are generated uh, by governments uh, or public institutes, uh, public health institutes, are not digital. You know, at the moment, they're all in the analog form and they're all in so many different forms. There's no global mm. standard. Yeah. Once those things are in place, then the travel app is going to be a real, uh, uh, a boon uh, to the modern day traveler. Okay. Stefano, you want to talk about travel pass a bit? Yes, uh, absolutely. I mean, I think, I mean, of course, I fully subscribe what Subhas has, uh, has just said, but in addition to this, I think what, what is uh, still not there, we are working on that, is that uh, there, there is a, a strong uh, international leadership that can coordinate with states uh, the implementation of it. 
let's not forget we need uh, a, a mutual recognition of states uh, to uh, use in the best way possible uh, that's the purpose of uh, these uh, digital uh, platforms uh, airports are of course uh, directly concerned uh, by by this challenge and this objective uh, because from an operational point of view you can imagine how difficult will be uh, to manage a process which is uh, not efficient if we do not rely on assets such as this one uh, to make sure that uh, you know the check is quick mm, and yeah. uh, in order to be quick well, of course i feel i picture uh, a scenario where we don't have to handle uh, 20 25 percent of traffic but uh, 80 90 100 percent if not more of uh, of people uh, to use uh, the uh, you know our uh, platforms and of course uh, the airport operators is involved the immigration custom is involved airlines are involved so there must be coordination but states have an important role to play because uh, these platforms benefit from uh, a network of labs that has to be recognized uh, by by the state and then mutually internationally applied uh, among uh, among states okay thanks for stepping up so um gentlemen on you know the time is just powered by it's been an amazing panel we've covered a lot of you know interesting ground and i think we could probably talk for a few more hours but unfortunately you know we only have an hour so i was hoping to ask you um your closing thoughts so just kind of think you know, 10 years from now, um, it's May of 2031, you know, we regather for the same panel um, to talk about the aviation sector. And uh, what will we be talking about in 10 years? Maybe you start with you, Victor. That's a good, good question, uh, uh, Greg. I think uh, in 10 years from now, we'll talk about, uh, uh, you know, this growing relevance of um, um, right-sizing, this growing search for, uh, you know, efficiency. Uh, you know, uh, although the market still looks green, we at Embraer, we're very optimistic about the future. Like I said, we see uh, uh, the right-sizing gaining relevance in the industry, even in emerging countries, even in regions that are usually focused on market share battles, you know, driven by high volumes, low margins. Uh, you know, a good indication of that is that so far we did not report any cancellations, some deferrals, but no cancellations at all. Uh, you know, last year, despite all the challenges we faced, we, we announced four new uh, customers to our operator base, Alliance and Pioneer in Australia, Bamboo Airways in Vietnam, uh, Myanmar Airways International in Myanmar. We had more than 40 uh, uh, aircraft placements, despite all the challenges we faced. Qantas has recently announced the operation of the U-19 partnership with Alliance Airlines as part of their uh, right aircraft on the right route mm -hmm. strategy. And, you know, what uh, puts us in, in a good competitive advantage is that the E-2 has broke the paradigm of um, uh, uh, higher cost per seat in a smaller capacity aircraft. The U-95 E-2, it has the potential to unlock the largest addressable markets that Embraer has ever had. You know, it offers 25% lower cost per trip and the same uh, cost per seat compared to a larger 180 seat narrow body aircraft. So it's a combination of right size and right cost or lower risk and higher profitability that makes it a compelling case. And that's make it uh, make me believe that in 10 years time, uh, we will uh, look at, you know, the previous 10 years and uh, we'll see a uh, uh, um, an increased footprint of Embraer in Asia. Okay, very that's, good. That's so, yeah. so more Embraer in Asia 2031. Um, Subhas, 2031, what, 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 are you, what would we be talking about? Well, you know, in the scheme of things, you know, two years uh, is not a, it's a, not a big, uh, big setback, you know. Uh, we had SARS for six months and then six months later, the industry was uh, chugging, uh, chugging again. Yeah. So two years, maybe four years, I think we'll be back on our feet. I think uh, what uh, 2031 will be looking like is that, uh, of course, keeping uh, travel consumers in mind, I think we will be um, a, an industry that is operating with smart technology solutions, making it uh, smooth, mm -hmm. making it um, um, safe, uh, and making it seamless uh, for travel. Uh, and secondly, I think uh, we will be a more environment-friendly uh, industry. Uh, we are using this uh, downtime 
to make sure that uh, we are greener when we get in the air again. Uh, and this means, you know, we are retiring older aircraft. Uh, uh, the industry is uh, looking at more uh, fuel efficient as well as economical aircraft. So um, it's all about SS, I think, you know, smart technology solutions, uh, sustainability and safety. Yeah, sustainability is going to be a massive, um, I mean, it's a, a very important issue right now, but that's only going to become increasingly, you know, pertinent as we get, get, get going for the next 10 years. Okay, thanks so much, Subas. Stefano, 2031. Yeah, I hope that uh, the forecast, uh, the prediction uh, that Asia Pacific uh, will provide uh, over half of the global uh, growth uh, will be respected that we will keep uh, this competitive advantage that uh, has uh, also uh, elaborated in terms of quality of the service, which is the top, uh, considering the, the global perspective, the global picture, and uh, that uh, the commitment uh, to, become, to be uh, environmentally uh, friendly, sustainable, uh, is, will, be, will be met even in this uh, part of, of the world. ACI uh, will uh, soon uh, commit uh, uh, on, on this aspect uh, at global level and uh, the Asia Pacific uh, uh, office uh, will play a role uh, uh, to build uh, the momentum on uh, environment, on CO2 uh, emission reduction uh, in dialogue in partnership with states and stakeholders. Okay, very good. And finally you, uh, Brendan, 2031, man. Yeah, um, well, certainly sustainability environment will, will, will be extremely important globally, including in Asia, where it's perhaps lagging a little bit at the moment. Um, and the technology um, will be very much uh, focused on that. I think uh, by then, uh, what, we'll, what we'll see from, uh, from an aircraft perspective uh, will, will be quite different, um, although maybe not in service uh, so much but or in the installed fleet, but I think in terms of on offer and um, it will be very much a, a new a new uh, era by then. Um, and uh, in terms of um, Asia, it's definitely uh, uh, you know I think uh, a lot of the, the forecast will 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 be um, will come true in terms of um, uh, particularly China growth, but also some of the other markets like Indonesia, uh, India, uh, Thailand, Vietnam. Their their emergence uh, in the global rankings will continue. Um, to climb, uh, and they will be, um, you know, major markets. Uh, you know, globally speaking, uh, there'll be several several major markets in, in Asia that will be at the in the top ten, and in, in, in terms of the global rankings. So, so so we'll continue to talk about uh, we'll be continuing to talk about Asia, uh, and, uh, and that will be a main driver. I mean, I, I just was looking at a lot. There's a lot of questions from the audience, and thank you for. Um, being so engaging and coming up with a lot of questions. There was a lot of questions about, about uh, you know, APAC timelines in terms of reopening and uh, how confident, you know, we are and what's what's the likely scenario. Now, that's, this is, uh, you know, unfortunate that I do think that uh, in the short term, Asia will be at a disadvantage uh, from an international market perspective, uh, given what we're seeing today. But I think that will eventually clear and that governments will eventually see what's happening elsewhere. And they'll need, they'll know they, to be competitive, uh, you know, from a tourism perspective and from the economic perspective, that 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 we will get through this, and that um, and that once that happens, um, Asia will 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 climb, uh, and and we will be um, you know at at the focus of growth, uh, certainly in the in the second uh, part of the five years, uh, second five years of the next ten years, and then by twenty thirty one we will be. Um, Will be, that will be very clear, um, you know, where Asia is, is positioned. Um, so, um, so I think there's going to be a lot of temporary setbacks, uh, but we will Asia will rise again and be at, at the focal uh, point of uh, of the industry uh, from a growth perspective. Yeah, Asia will rise again. We'll be back. Okay, well. That unfortunately brings us to the end of what has been a fascinating discussion. Um, I would like to thank each of our panelists for giving so generously of their time and expertise today. I'd also like to thank the audience for all the um, excellent questions. You know, uh, sorry we couldn't get to all of them. Um, there were quite a few, but I think we covered you know some really key points about you know the current state of play in Asia and how we're going to get out of this you know extremely challenging time for the aviation sector. 
Um, but I'd also, I would also like to thank our sponsor, Embraer, for helping to make today's webinar successful, as well as our partner for the series, the Singapore Air Show. And you know, we certainly hope to see everybody there um, you know, next year. And thank you, of course, for joining us and asking the great questions. Um, please keep your eye on flakeglobal.com where we will be publishing details of upcoming webinars. We would love to have you join us again. And until then, from the Flight Global team, goodbye. And uh, we hope to see you on a plane soon. Have a great day. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.